We have a rather curious subject this morning, one which many persons have heard about, but very few really know much about, and that is the great cycle of the Grail, which has become one of the most important descents of symbolism in the Christian world. During the Romance period in Europe, there were a long group of troubadours, many poets, literary people, persons in almost every walk of life, religious and secular, who centered their patterns of living around what was called the, the legend of the quest, the search for the Holy Grail. And in spite of a tremendous amount of research, and the research into hundreds of manuscripts, the problem of the Grail remains very largely unsolved. So this morning we want to approach it a little differently, not dogmatically, to see if we can see a little more of the influence of this tradition, not only upon the people of the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, but upon the world as it is today. But part of the story seems to come down even into our own time. Where it all began is quite unknown. Uh, probably it is pre-Christian originally. It may have begun in Persia or Chaldea or one of the other nations of the Near East. But it was the story of a search, a search for the most holy relic of Christendom, the Holy Grail, the cup from which Christ drank at the communion of the Last Supper. The fact that the cup continued to exist is variously supported by myth, by legend, and by certain semi-historical accounts. Probably one of the most prominent and common legends is the, that to the effect that it was brought to Britain by Joseph of Arimathea. He was the one who loaned or gave his tomb for Christ's body to rest in in the Holy Sepulchre. Joseph reached England probably around the year 50 or 60 A.D., and is supposed to have brought with him the Holy Grail and the handkerchief of St. Veronica. Uh, Veronica herself is said by some to have also been in this small group that under persecution left the Near East, traveled through France, came to the coast of France, and journeyed over to Britain, where they were hospitably received and where the original church of Glastonbury was built. So as far as the English tradition is concerned, Glastonbury becomes the center of the great uh, grail cycle. Glastonbury is a, a, an area in rather swampy land surrounded by marshes that were known in ancient times as Avalon. And it was to Avalon at the time of his death uh, that Arthur was carried by the mysterious women in the great black barge that took his soul to the afterlife. All of these stories seem to have some kind of a special meaning. The bard sang them, and they were carried through many different cycles of poetry and prose. They appear in the Near East. We find references to them in Islam. But we do not seem to be able to make a solid statement of what is fact and what is fable, what is fanciful and what is symbolical. Perhaps the symbolical development of the story began in Alexandria which was a mingling ground for practically all of the religions of the world in the period from the 2nd century B.C. to the 3rd century A.D. Here a great many sacred writings were preserved. Here the Gnostics and the Essenes created their schools of thought. 
the Neoplatonists and the Neopythagoreans. And also here, according to the ancient tradition, uh, the first college of Christianity was established by the Apostle Mark. So there are many stories of this particular series of events or cycles, and perhaps it is useful at this time to consider what the meaning might be. The order of the quest was always more or less the same in the story. It was added to a little and subtracted from a little by different writers, but it centered around three distinct objects. One was the Holy Grail, which was the most important of the hallows, as they were called. The second was the spear of the centurion Longinus, which is supposed to have pierced the side of Christ. And the third is the wreath of thorns. These have been variously sanctified in different parts of the world. Great cathedrals of Europe have declared that they possessed these objects. The problem of trying to verify the story is about as difficult as verifying the mystery of the Shroud of Turin. But in the whole picture of it, one point stands out. It is always a search. Every part of the Grail legend dealing with Galahad, the guileless knight, Parseval, Lohengrin, and many others, these were all seeking for something. They were searching for a vision. And it is said that Parseval and Galahad attained the vision of the Grail. And that after the death of Parseval, the Grail was taken to India, where it was enshrined in the kingdom of Prester John, the Christian emperor of Asia. All legend, all myth. But where in all of these stories is there something very important? A, a number of scholars trying to find what was called the hidden church of the Grail finally came to the conclusion that the search was fruitless, that they would never be able to find a church in this world that fulfilled the requirements of this mystery. They finally decided, therefore, that the Church of the Holy Grail was not in the material world, and yet it existed, and that it became part of a great descent of man's aspiration after enlightenment. The search was always the same. The search was for light. The search was for union with reality and was a great dedication, a pilgrimage toward reality. As we go into this, we find an interesting factor presenting itself. And that is that from the beginning there is an overtone in the grail cycle that seems to suggest that in every instance the, the grail search must be an individual effort. There was no way of joining something. There was no way of proclaiming a membership or depending upon a group support for the attainment of the quest. You could not become part of a congregation of the Church of the Holy Grail. Every part of it had to be individual. The individual himself was searching to become one with the communion of saints, with those of the other life who had attained the illumination of the soul. It was therefore the soul in man searching for the eternal soul in life. And this search had to be a personal dedication. Those who achieved the search and finally beheld the grail became a company apart, but they were never organized as an organization. They became mutually knowing of each other 
because they had all attained the same level of insight. They were part of a level of internal illumination and not an organization. This seems to meet most of the requirements of the subject, but leads, of course, inevitably to the dedication for the search, a dedication which was part of the vow of knighthood back in the medieval period. The vigil of the grail was always in a church, and a knight uh, receiving uh, ordination into his order spent the first night in, in prayer and meditation before the altar of his local church. Having thus dedicated himself internally by a voluntary action of his own, he started out on a quest which no one could assist him. No one could do it for him. No one could walk with him. No one must, could must prevent him from making mistakes. It was a lonely journey, a journey from illusion to light, from darkness uh, to participation in eternal truth. This actually did affect the rise of the Christian faith in the early medieval period. The Grail Cycle, regardless of its origin, which may have been among the mystery schools of Egypt, uh, Asia, North Africa, Greece, all of these countries, but wherever it began, it became a key to the religion that had no physical structure a religion that was entirely subjective, a religion to which each individual made his own commitment, and having made this commitment, either succeeded or failed, in either case alone. Therefore, perhaps the entire quest of the Grail is best summarized in the words of Plotinus, who observed on occasion that the way to truth was the journey of a lonely person to that which is eternally alone. It was this aloneness that seems to have been the power of the grail. Each individual had to call entirely upon his own internal resources. He had to train himself, he had to dedicate himself, he had to consecrate himself. He had to master one by one the weaknesses of his own flesh. He had to overcome the pressures and temptations of ambition and avarice. He had to purify his own nature by a vow taken only to the very highest part of himself. He must slowly climb that mountain between his own material nature and the attainment of the enlightenment of his inner soul. It is a very interesting concept and probably has never been fully explored, except that there are records and indications that certain persons apparently achieved this tremendous dedication. Also, it was twisted into the cycle of alchemy at one time, so that the purification of the metals, the transformation of all that is base into all that is sacred, was the great alchemical transmutation performed alone by an alchemist in his little laboratory by prayer and meditation and on rare occasion by some type of miraculous manifestation. To the grail cycle, the miraculous was an internal mystery. It did not deal with the commonplace of life. Miracles did not interfere with the workings of universal law. Miracles were inner experiences of attainment, a proof that the reality was nearer than it had been before. The problem of the origin of the grail, again, has a great many legends associated with it. One legend says that it was carved from the crest jewel of the archangel Lucifer, when he fell from heaven. Others say that it was part of the basin of consecration found in the ancient rites of the tabernacle in the wilderness. 
Some believe that it was the ecstatic cup of Bacchus or Dionysus in Greece. In most cases, it was a chalice in which the individual had to find ways and attain to the possibility of cleansing the inside of his own cup, which was the uh, actual meaning of the term. Now, in doing this thought, or living this way, we find that there arose in North Africa and in early Christendom a teaching that was to become very important in the life of people. And this teaching was the cultivation of the power of internal visualization. In other words, the individual gradually transformed these ideals into inner pictures. These pictures, like the oriental mandalas, were visualizations of a superior state of being, visualizations which impel the individual to fulfill them or to achieve the mysteries which they represented. And uh, in some of the old English block books and on the continent also, the uh, city of the Grail or the Church of the Grail is placed at the at the top of a top part of the great Ptolemaic system of the solar system. You climb the ladder of the seven planets to reach the entrance of the secret house. This house was above the firmament, and there dwelt together the deity, the triangle, the triangular trinity, and the abode of the blessed. So the uh, whole concept gradually became a series of self-disciplines by means of which the individual sought to remove from his nature all forms of defilement. Now the beginning of the grail journey was always the same. It was, first of all, the realization of a great need. And I think maybe that is where we have to begin our thinking. No matter who we are or how well equipped we are to for life, there are always areas in which desperate need arises. No individual is completely sufficient to his own necessity. Those who think they are are simply egotists because there is no one who can be so protected either by his own mind or environment or by his worldly goods that he is free of crisis, free of danger, free of, de of death de disappointment, free of disillusionment and despair. Therefore, the beginning of it all is the concept or realization that we are all imperfect, and also that by the kind of world we live in, the grace of a divine power has made it possible for us to overcome these imperfections in ourselves. The individual can live a good life, a life that is not temporalized by advantages or corruptions. The individual can be a true Christian. But to do this, he must make decisions. And very often, he must turn his back on the very church he came, claims to belong to. Because it is not possible for the individual who is dedicated to the search to accept a theology as the basis of his own enlightenment. He must realize that his journey to the grail is one of dedication and personal victory over the weaknesses of nature, the possibility of living nearer and nearer to the love of God by direct personal unfoldment. Therefore, in the search for the grail, there must first be rites of purification. The individual must gradually, to the best of his ability, put his life in order. He will not be able to do so perfectly, that is understood, but he must make a gradual effort to get over the problems by which he is bound to an inferior state by his own center of consciousness. He must get over all grievances. He must fulfill the commandments of Jesus. 
He must dedicate his goods to the need of the, those who are impoverished. He must give graciously of himself at all times. He must hold nothing and demand nothing. He must never con conspire to gain anything for himself, including a conspiracy after truth. He must not have any of these motivations behind his action. There must be only true and simple uh, acceptance and practice of the noblest form of life which he can experience. Now, if by this type of problem or this type of living, he gradually overcomes the major weaknesses of his own nature, he gradually comes into a state of internal tranquility. And tranquility is the open door to the sanctuary of the grail. Tranquility means peace with reality. It means that the individual accepts without question the true teachings of his religion, whatever it may be, and lives it without restriction or compromise. He must have, therefore, the ability to quiet all of the confusions which beset the average person. Now, confusions are very often things that cannot be overcome easily. Sometimes a life is harassed to the degree that it would not appear that the individual could make a new start in his own inner life. But he can if he will. There is never a time in the life of any living thing that has a consciousness in which that consciousness cannot be released constructively. It is a matter of willingness to be dedicated. Assuming that the person achieves this type of dedication, it might be regarded as an order of knighthood. He becomes the first uh, grade of the search for the grail. And all the knights dedicated their sword handles, which were the form of the cross, to the good fight, the battle to overcome the darkness in self and to protect the light in others. The knights of the garter and so forth were always out protecting people in distress and saving the maiden who was in the hands of the villain. The maiden was the soul, which is always in the hands of the villain until the individual redeems himself. So the knighthood of the grail began by this proof of courage, proof of integrity. The uh, no, young knight did not know what he was going to find. He had no promise that he would find it. He was simply told that his hope was to only through the conquest of himself, that no one else could help him, and all the prayers in the world could not bring him the peace that he had to earn by the development of his own character. And he might pray for character, but if he did not have the courage to live it, it would not come to him. So having gone through all these problems and coming finally to the Gnostic quietude, the individual lacks none of the needs of life, but has an inner tranquility in which he lives in this world but not of it. He performs all the duties that are his proper responsibilities in life. All effort to escape responsibility is treason as far as the way of the grail is concerned. The individual must never try to grow by neglecting something else. He must fulfill according to the best conscience that he possesses every daily responsibility. He must bear all burdens without complaint. He must recognize that all occurrences are lessons, and that each lesson that comes, the more difficult the lesson, the greater the attainment. And it is upon this climbing this ladder of circumstances, this mysterious stairway of incidents, and conquering them one by one, that he attain, attains to the great the gate of the Grail Temple. 
Having come to this point, then, he settles down to the next step of his growth, namely what the Oriental has always known, the meditative arts. The quietude and contemplation enables the individual to relax and allow the best of his own inner life to come through. When we relax, one of two things happens. If we are not too well oriented and pretty much bound to our mistakes, when we relax, we're miserable. When we relax, we have all kinds of negative thoughts. We worry, we're frightened, we're concerned, we're disappointed, we're disillusioned. We think of the people who have mistreated us and how the world is failing us in our needs. So to the person who is not self-disciplined, relaxation and quietude just end in misery, which is what is intended, because there is no way in which we can accomplish the purpose until we are able to see within ourselves that we have conquered these mistaken points of view. So by degrees, the individual gains the ability to relax and be quiet. Now, this is, has a sort of an initiation with it, because when you get to this point, you've got to relax and be quiet. You've got to be able to sit down quietly and in peace with life and in peace with yourself. Contemplate the common problem things that we all have to do. The individual must learn the importance of being able to get along with himself and that his great enemy has always been himself. And until he conquers that, he can go no further. He is a victim of his own mistakes. He is a victim of his own wrong attitudes, wrong objectives, wrong ambitions, wrong decisions. He is a victim of every lesson he sought to avoid or evade. Every time he fails to do that which is next, he penalizes himself and adds to the burden of his own subconscious mind. So the harrowing of Hades, in the old classical terminology, the descent into limbo, represents the individual cleaning out his own subconscious with which he has to live. It is either a paradiso or a purgatorio, according to how he has trained it. If he is selfish, his internal subconscious conscious isn't worth living with. In fact, it would be very hard to live with it. And yet we go along day by day, failing to realize that we are building a toxic subconscious, that we are building an internal life and the only way we can escape from it is keep our objective consciousness so busy that we have no time to think about the facts of life. We can get only be comfortable, so to say, if we can get our minds off of ourselves. And usually we find some useless way of doing it. For instance, when we can't stand ourselves any longer, we turn on the television, and as a result of that, our punishment is magnified. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, we, uh, that is the purgatory which we uh, uh, get into as a result of not being able to be quiet and read a good book. Also, the book sometimes can be a problem. But any event, the, the problem is always the individual running away from himself. He wants to get away from the things about himself he doesn't like. And if he sits down quietly, there are numerous things he doesn't like. But if anyone else points them out to him, they no longer are his friend. They are his enemy if they tell him the truth. And therefore, it's useless for them to tell him the truth. He won't believe it. He will only hate them. He must find it for himself. He must live with his own mistakes until he can face them. And as he gradually gets rid of this load of pressures within himself, he begins truly to clean the inside of his own cup. And having attained as far as he can go in this, he will discover that when the inner consciousness of his mind and emotions are at rest, 
he will for the first time begin to experience the mystery of the invisible source of life. He will discover the teacher self when he is able to overcome the false teachings which he has permitted to uh, overwhelm his life. It's the same problem as we have in the legend of the fallen angels, in which my, the human mind has fallen into the hopeless confusion of ignorance. A ignorance which can be either learned or unlearned, but ignorance which is at all times the handicap, that which stands between, that which prevents the unfoldment of the natural life. We find also that uh, mystics and uh, the whole grail cycle is a mystical tradition. That mystics always have represented the feeling of an immediate personal communion with the divine. The mystic always has believed that the final way to know the truth is not to gain it from others, but to search it in the self. Uh, to gradually find ways to attain a mystical transcendency over the obligations of existence. So this type of thought is the principle behind mysticism, which is a gentle, loving dedication. And gradually, as the mind's subconscious pressures are relaxed, we discover the uh, arrival or the emergence through vigil, which is a vigilance over self. We find that in this, the visions occur. Nearly all mysticism is accompanied by visions. Visions of something better and something greater. Those who have not accomplished also have visions. Visions of danger. Visions of fear. Visions of believing things to be worse than they are believing that they have a right to hate people who do not hate them. All these things are the negative visions. But when the mystic is, has his visions, he beholds an inner life, a betterness. He has the experience of an exaltation above the present state of his affairs. Almost all religious art is aimed at this level of the individual's growth namely the level of portraying, figuring, symbolizing in some tangible way the intangibles of the inner life. That in some way the meditation upon a sacred picture helps to strengthen this inner resolve, helps to make the inner life quiet, peaceful, and beautiful. Everything that helps to make our inner life beautiful is bringing us along the path. Everything that comes along that makes our inner life discordant or defaced or deformed is de contributing to hindrance. And the great hindrances are the pressures of personal ambition, personal pride, and the desire to accumulate worldly goods. All these things have to be worked out by those who are going to seek for the mysterious crusade for the grail who are going to search for the cup of eternity. So this brings the individual to the next general feeling. From the purification of himself comes also then the strengthening of his inner realization of deity. Of course, we all have more or less idealistic concepts of God. But these concepts are very much of a material nature. God becomes a person, like the figure on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome, where God is casting off the one, the sun and the moon, and where with a very long beard and a very patriarchal look, he reaches out to the hand of Adam. Uh, these physical things are the way we inevitably and instinctively think of deity. We think of deity either as a patriarchal figure or a matriarchal figure. We think of deity as father, mother, or father-mother. 
we think of a parental person. We look around us and we see a, a very nice looking patriarchal people and have a feeling that they sort of look a little like the way God must look. But to the mystic, this is not possible. The mystic must also realize in the course of his growth that he must try to find some nobler way of experiencing or inwardly visualizing the nature of deity. This was brought out in the mandala meditations of the East, where the effort is to reconstruct a spiritual universe as a reality which can be contemplated, which can become a new geography based in a divine light. But even here, the danger still exists that these things are merely an, an attenuating of physical factors. There is apparently no positive approach to the nature of deity. We can tell what it is not, but when you come to tell what it is, there is always a certain uncertainty. But in the search of meditation, we find almost all mystical schools have religious observances, not, not observances demanded by some system. When they're demanded by a system, they're very dangerous. But a natural desire to understand more of the substance of things unseen. And this becomes the basis of a meditational development. The individual may meditate in the presence of sacred objects which have a tendency to lift the mind but are themselves transitory but they are part of the growth process which must be gone through the eastern christian monk gazing with meditative veneration at the icon of, of his of one of his saints or a beautiful picture of the virgin mary these have a tendency to discriminate they cause the individual to find joy in that which is truly the source of joy, rather than to find joy in little things, mortal uh, preoccupations that have no essential meaning. Everything that helps in the constructive yearning towards reality. And then we come to another problem of hindrances which has to be considered, and that is, do people really want this? Does the individual really want to live this kind of a quest? Or is it going to gradually turn on him as a frustration in which he is miserable trying to be good? If such is the case, he has to stop immediately. Because unless the moods that grow in him fulfill him and make him happier than he ever was before, then something is basically wrong in the uh, uh, work he is attempting. He is never supposed to give up the world with a terrible sense of loss. If he does, he should stay where he is. He should give up the world only when in his heart and soul he is rejoicing at having discovered something greater than the world, something more important, something that he can love more fully, more completely, and more permanently. And if this does not appear, then this step of the quest is a failure. And many of the knights of the round table tried these different quests, which are very interesting, because only one or two of the whole group ever saw the grail. Something always stopped them. The thing that stopped them was their own lack of worthiness. They got sidetracked. They got mixed up in something else. And gradually the vision of the quest faded away. They still believed in it, but the belief in it was not the quest itself and it never can be. We can believe in anything, but unless the believing transforms ourselves, it is of no it is of no basic value or permanence. But assuming that the individual has gotten this far in one piece and is going along fairly well, then we have this these rungs of the ladder of meditation. We find the problem of growth involves not only the uh, transformation of evil, but it, the glorification of good. The individual 
in order to really understand life, the great world of divine principles and causes, was placed in a garden where he was supposed to name all things according to their natures. He has rather named all things according to his own likes and dislikes, which is not the same thing. But in all of this problem, he has to recognize the importance of the experiences of growth. For instance, the, uh, the mind must be developed. The various arts and sciences are rungs of a ladder. The individual is not wrong because he's a biologist. He's not wrong because he happens to be a grammarian. It is all a problem of what he is inwardly motivated by. If he is properly motivated, all sciences, arts, philosophies, crafts, and trades are equally sacred. If he is not so motivated, they are all equally profane. Therefore, it is not that the individual should uh, walk away from experience or try to go off somewhere and live in a hermit cell for the rest of his life or renounce humanity. A great many people just renounce humanity. And they try to get along without it. They try to leave behind every disagreeable task. They resent every social restriction. They dislike con uh, constantly uh, the ineffectiveness of governments and for religions and educations and everything and come out very desperately against prevailing systems. This doesn't do much good. It constantly adds to a negative sense of criticism. It proves that the individual is still functioning without the gleam of eternal light that should be within himself. So he has to start in and look over everything he doesn't like and find out why it is important, why he needs it, why he must understand it, and very often why he must transcend it by a full action of consciousness. So the individual who tries to excuse his weaknesses by pointing out the weaknesses of other people is not moving in the right direction at all. The person who wishes to make a dona donation of their lives to a divine cause must have something to give. They must have an achievement, an accomplishment, a value that can be used in life. We must not bury the talent or the talents. We must use them if we would be called good and faithful servants. So by using the talents, we are able to gain not only a certain and additional ability to live well in this world, but at the same time, we are beginning to gather, gain a better insight of the dimensions of that greater world we aspire to. We have to realize that all of the arts and sciences are like radiant stars suspended in a universal heaven. They bring light where darkness would otherwise be. We have to learn to recognize that knowledge is not bad. If it's true knowledge, it is very good. But to accept it as knowledge is not enough. We must find the spiritual soul behind knowledge. We must find the divine reality from which all forms of knowledge are suspended. If we do not accomplish this, we can go out and abuse knowledge and throw our world into war and disaster. hurt and free from hurting others. He must not do anything by means of which the tragedies of life are magnified. He must have the very kindest and most gentle attitude towards everything. He must realize the importance of being at peace even in the midst of chaos. This type of thing and this realization of what should be then helps the individual to gain this equilibrium, and he becomes a knight errant. He becomes one dedicated to the service of 
the system, the grail system, the goddess system, the orders of the quest, uh, the orders of the bath, and all the great night, orders of chivalry. The search for the golden fleece, which is the great order of chivalry in Europe, on the continent, is again the same thing. The golden fleece is the ray of light flowing from the Lamb of God. So all these things tie in, and little by little, we begin to reverse the sources of our inspiration and influence. But we also have to have the courage and discrimination to know when we can even accept our own attitudes. And the only way we can do that is to be so selfless that there is no way in which we can be tempted to misuse any knowledge that comes to us. After this, we come to the truly meditational uh, problem. Having cleansed the heart and mind from all traces of ulterior attitudes, the individual can for the first time come into the state of prayer. Prayer up to that time is just a conversation, usually with the lower part of yourself. But when that part is no longer there, prayer became, becomes a contact with the highest inspirational levels of consciousness. And because these inspirational levels have the power to perfect or rationalize or make whole all the disasters of the flesh, prayers are answered by the constant increasing of the divine consciousness within the person. Little by little, the, the divine takes over. And where the divine takes over, there is no longer any need for prayer because the individual lives constantly in the light of God. So in the uh, continuing of these thinkings, we come to the period of beginning to be useful. We must have some kind of a cause. The night without a cause is in serious trouble. But the cause is dedication to whatever is necessary in life. Now this brings in a point that seems to be inconsistent. And from the outside it is inconsistent. But there is a, an inner meaning to it which we can find uh, has a consistency. We are taught to purify ourselves and to free ourselves from worldliness. And yet we are also taught to turn back and serve, serve those who are in worldliness. We have to go back to feed the hungry, cleanse the leper, heal the sick, and according to the teachings of Christ, finally to raise the dead. Therefore, we have a job here, even though we are outgrowing here. And the reason why we feel this need for this com commitment is because the persons who are in trouble are usually not able at that time to sustain themselves. A person in sorrow or trouble is sorrowful or troubled because they do not have the internal light to rise above this type of thing. Therefore, comfort and consolation is important to them, but it must be given always in the sense of a reality. It can never be the individual being taught to do things he shouldn't do because they'll make him happy. Always the motives must be unselfish, and the advice, uh, suggestions, recommendations, or assistance must always be in the terms of helping the person to grow. The growth must come before true freedom from pr pressure is possible. On the way up from this point, we have the Hindu yoga, we have all the Zen teachings, we have everything in which the person gradually comes into the full control of his own inner life. Uh, there's this first Zen fable of the old Zen master who, having uh, attained a very great degree of meditation, was walking quietly along the shores of a river, the banks of a river. And thoughtlessly, because his mind was on other things, he walked right out onto the river. 
and he walked all the way across without even his feet being wet. If, however, he had suddenly realized what he was doing, he'd have probably sunk to the bottom of the river. But while his heart and consciousness were above the level and restrictions of the body, he was safe. And I think to some degree this has to explain firewalking and other phenomena of ancient peoples and still uh, experiences that are still carried on in our modern world. Namely, that if the individual can become completely unaware of fear, unaware of failure, unaware of, every, of any self-interest, or unaware of pride, which might be damaged by a failure. Gradually, what we might term the impossible becomes real, as Christ walking on the waters, which of course is a symbol of the Christ in you, walking upon the surface of the torrents and the tempests unmoved by material circumstances. So the gradually the, the Church of the Holy Grail concept is the person gradually becoming part of an assemblage of the enlightened. This assemblage of the enlightened we find in the mythology of Egypt and of Greece and of most ancient peoples. Like the mysterious mountain in the ta tablet of Cebes, the person rises finally to a mysterious and wonderful castle on the top of the mountain. This is the castle of the inner life, the consciousness. This is the castle that is referred to in, al in alchemy as the shut, uh, the shut palace of the king. It is the divine acacia, the place of wisdom, love, and veneration. So little by little we climb up and do what in the Buddhist philosophy means that we ascend to the level or degree of bodhisattvahood, where we become dedicated patrons, guardians, and protectors of all that live. We also become the agents and means of a tremendous dedication, a tremendous service. And it is a service that becomes all important and nothing else is important at all. So little by little, the conquest of self brings with it the only true happiness that exists in this world. And this happiness does not exist completely in this world because it comes to those who, while they live in this world, have attained an understanding and insight of something higher and more wonderful. Now, the story of the cup, of course, has a series of meanings. The cup is the sand grail, or the holy cup, or the sangre real, which is the container of the blood of Christ. It also has been represented in various forms, and uh, in a safe deposit box in New York, there is what is called the Great Chalice of Antioch, which is supposed to be uh, a magnificent work of art containing, woven, and built into its substance the original Holy Grail. But the uh, Church of the Holy Grail, as the mystics understood it, cannot accept this because the cup simply never existed as a cup. If it was a pewter cup or clay cup, which Christ drank from, it was probably long forgotten and broken. But the symbol of it is eternal. Here is the cup which contains the ever-flowing blood of consciousness. Here is the life of the human being, a life sustained forever a life flowing into everything that lives and creating the great sacrament of the Eucharist. The sacrament of the Eucharist had to be experienced in the search for the grail. It was the last of the hallows, the last of the great dedications. And in this, the uh, symbol of the Eucharist, we have the representation of the ever-flowing life and light of redemption, flowing into everything that lives, Further than that, that life itself, by which we all live, and without which none of us can live, the very energy within our bodies, the very power to be or to exist, is due to the continuing source of strength 
of vitality and of life, which flows from the eternal. We are all alive by virtue of the fact that life exists, and life in its existence is a manifestation of redemption, salvation, regeneration, and the resurrection of the dead. So we have a certain sense of duty. The, uh, the very energy by which we get up in the morning is not our own. The energy we argue with a neighbor about is not our own. The unkind words we energize are a misuse of energy. The waste of energy, the, the depletion of the resources of the body through evil habits, narcotics, drugs, and all these things, all of these are the corruption of a divine power. They are the misuse of the actual presence of God in us at all times. If it was not for that presence, we would be lumps of clay. We cannot exist unless life sanctions and justifies our existence. It was this life that fashioned us. It is this life that sustains us. It's from this life we came, and it is to this life we go. And this life is the entire mystery of the Grail quest. It is the quest for the everlastingness which is behind all things as an attribute of deity. The mystic, therefore, very often says uh, that he does not die, that when the time comes for him to depart from this life, some mysterious miracle occurs and he doesn't die. The physical interpretation of this is very, has very little substance in reality. The, the only one who didn't and cannot die is the one who finally was the eternal itself. Therefore, all things have their comings and their goings. But the alchemist and the mystic is t was taught that the transition from this world to the next is not a death, and the perfect acceptance of life overcomes the illusion of the reality of death. In other words, that in which life exists may be transformed, the body of it may be changed, the life may be incorporated into other creatures, but life itself cannot die. And life it has, by its own energy, produced the evolution of the various kingdoms of nature, including man. That life does not die. The life in the individual cannot die. But it can depart from the body. But this departure is not death. It is transition into another dimension of space. Therefore, the uh, search for the grail not only continues throughout the material life, but the attainment of the degrees of manifestation that are possible to the human being allows this process to continue. And the individual who in this world passes out in a state of dedicated de uh, reality finds himself in another great room in the house or castle of the Holy Grail. Because the Holy Grail uh, uh, stands for those other mansions referred to by which man uh, is ultimately to ascend to the fulfillment of his own purposes in the divine life of things. Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. Were it not so, I would have told you. And these many mansions are the rooms of the castle of the grail, invisible but eternal. In the ancient uh, uh, Hebraic mysticism, the temple in Jerusalem is said to have been built on the top of Mount Moriah, on the threshing floor of the Jebusite. But the real temple of Jerusalem is in the sky above. And the real temple of the Grail is not in or with any church on earth, but is above them. And that which is eternal is always dominant, always leads all things. Now, many people, including the Gnostics and the Neoplatonists, tried to find ways to accomplish 
uh, this release from the ignorance and struggle of materialism into this path that does lead to, in fi to final emancipation. Therefore, they attempted to create something that was not creedal, not denominational, not tied to any religion, but was essentially the essence of all of them. Because all religion has one essential purpose. That is that the individual shall come to perfection and union with deity. All religions were paths leading to God. And uh, the Neoplatonists and others found that this became a very wonderful basis for a unity which we do not suspect. If all these paths all lead to the same end, then all denominational and creedal uh, uh, in inequality uh, is meaningless. The individual, wherever sincerity dwells, God dwells with us and has helping and leading us to the better way of life. So on the basis of this fact, the Gnostics and uh, the Persians and several others created the concept of the great religion in space, that there was one eternal spiritual science. There was one great church, one great cathedral. It might have all different names. It might be worshipped by a thousand different sects. But they all, without knowing it or with some hope, without any understanding, they all are on pilgrimage to the same house the house of hidden places, itself hidden. Every material aspiration is a step forward in the journey toward the universal church, the church which never began as far as man is concerned and will never end as long as there is need anywhere for the grace of God to be disseminated throughout creation. So this uh, idea was developed gradually until it became this over-faith. And it was very valuable during periods of religious persecution because there were many uh, generations in which all effort at piety uh, could lead to martyrdom. The all dedications to outside sects led to frightful wars, terrible abuses, religious persecutions and fanaticisms. And all of these ter terrible incidents uh, faced the individual whenever he tried to express any uh, functional or organized religious belief. Therefore, the true religion was held in secret. All of these outward forms of it were symbols of its own inner mystery. The symbols were obvious to those who understood, and those who did not understand could gradually en enlighten their inner life until the understanding came to them. But it was better for the realization that in this world there has never been but one religion, and that religion is set forth in the great spiritual and moral codes of humanity. And it has been disseminated throughout the world by religious teachers, by messiahs, by saviors, by martyrs, who have given everything to bring the code to earth, to bring the reality to earth. But the religion itself remains undivided. And all who seek to uh, find the, the sacred altar of the grail, the Parsifals and the Galahads, all have to come in the end to the same altar. But even if they do, they may not know it. They may not realize at all that it's the same. But the point is that in their inner lives, they are doing the same things, and they're doing them essentially in the same ways, but perhaps have different names for them. Thus, every virtue is a universal quality which cannot be divided. It spreads itself through everything that lives and exists whereas every vice is a local situation. It is something that exists for a little time in certain places due to misunderstandings. But the more you put vices together, the more they battle each other until one vice destroys another, as two wars will destroy each other. 
but virtues, wherever they are, feed each other. For in virtues there is always peace and harmony. Therefore, virtues are eternal and immortal. Vices are temporal and mortal. And by releasing the mind and heart from the vices, we become again in the presence of the realities. So the Church of the Holy Grail is the invisible sanctuary of truth, the real heart of God. And the real heart of God is the eternal love of deity disseminated through all the worlds and all the spheres of existence. And this love has its particular and proper abode in the heart of each of us. It is this love in the heart which is the Redeemer. And in this case, the blood of God in our own hearts is really blood flowing in a grail or cup. The heart itself is the, is the vessel in which the living blood of God is forever disseminated throughout the world. Gradually coming to understand these things doesn't in any way interfere with practical experiences of living. It simply dedicates them. It baptizes actions and circumstances. The blood of truth baptizes every action that we make in our daily existence. So on and on the path went, and it was believed that in the course of time, the mystery of the grail would be solved. But in Europe, the, way, the light of truth began to fade out. For a long time, men were neglected the inner truth of things. And therefore it was said that the angels took the grail out of Europe and brought it finally to Asia. The Western issue is that it was brought to Glastonbury, where it is buried somewhere. It is hidden as a symbol of the physical uh, perfection of life. The chances are that physically it was not taken to either place because it is not a physical thing. It is simply the chalice of spiritual ecstasy. It's the mystery of the entheus, of the foreverness in God, which we call enthusiasm, which originally was the sacred emotion of man's complete acceptance of God. So all these little stories and big stories and legends, old and new, all seem to tell us that there is the Church of the Holy Grail, the Church of Parsifal, of Monsalvat, on the heights of, of Spain, the mysterious lands and gods of the Nordic peoples, and Valhalla, the abode of heroes. Everywhere we find the same thing, the Olympus of the Greek, the Miru of India, the Shambhala of Tibet. These are all symbols of the secret church, the mysterious sanctuary which forever remains and to which each aspiring soul comes in search of reality. In each generation, the number of those who make the search increases. Little by little, the uh, journey is more generally understood. Also, in the cases of those who have advanced a little way and have found peace and have found high kindness and have come to love that which they once either hated or ignored, these people are, are eleven in a loaf. Each of those who becomes a knight of the grail becomes a, a defender of the faith a defender of all that is good in humanity and, is deep, and all that is worthwhile in the mystery of life itself. Therefore, each of the mystics that comes along, mystics like uh, Bami or any of the ancient mystics, mystics that of, of Egypt, Greece, great philosophers, Plato, Pythagoras, Socrates, all these had gone a little way and had become acolytes, so to say, in this sacred assembly. 
And yet they didn't recognize the sacred assembly as a separate thing at all. This mysterious church of the Holy Grail has the earth itself for its checkerboard floor. The great combinations of integrities and honor are the columns that rise above the floor of the sanctuary. And the arches of the dome, as the one writer said, are the clasped hands of comrades. The whole church is a living thing. It is humanity. It is that which must gradually come to be the most worshipful and the most purposeful of all human institutions. We are going to have to move away from the concept that the material world is the reality and that according to how things go here, so they go hereafter. We have got to come finally to the recognition that this world is a sanctuary itself. Every part of it is part of one sacred house. This sacred house is the home of all kinds of living things. And in this home, which is the one great church, many little churches have been built by persons of various convictions and dedications. But after all, the earth itself, the solar system, the cosmos, all are sanctuaries. It is a mistake to think of any of them as materialistic mechanical devices. The earth is not just simply a physical planet with an atmosphere extending a few miles from its surface. The solar system is not a machinery of planets. Cosmos is not a mechanism of stars. These are all parts of great eternal principles manifesting forever. And it's man's possibility to climb the ladder of stars to go on and on and on until he becomes fully aware of his place in the universe of things. And this search to the knowledge or awareness of realities, of course, is the quest of the grail. It is the continuing struggle of all that lives to grow. Birds, animals, insects, everything have the great pressure to survive. And for man and for all creatures, True survival is not the survival of the body, but the survival of the God within the body. We are all concerned with the myth of the dying God and the resurrection of that God through our own personal contribution to the integrities of the world. And as we gather a little bit here in Christmas time, it might be valuable to realize some of these points that we are living in a world of divine potential. There is nothing that is necessary to us that is not available. But we cannot come to the greater while we cling desperately to the lesser. We cannot be gods and mortals at the same time. Actually, we never were mortals in the truest sense of the word. We have always been gods in disguise. At the moment, we are gods in distress. Difficulties and problems are gathering around us. But behind, within, and about all of these is this immense sanctuary of life. Universes going on, cosmic systems going on, galaxies going on, and all that exists, the living church of the grail, the one tremendous structure of universal integrities. You can't join it in the ordinary sense of paying dues. It's not interested in dues, but it does have some, something about it. It wants nothing, needs nothing, and can use nothing but the best of each of us. That which is the true, true reality in us can become part of the great congregation of the grail. And this congregation is dedicated in many ways to the service of eternal truth. Truth must always have hands and feet in order to function in a world of hands and feet. Where there are no hands and feet, it has other members. But here, each dedicated person helps to release or perfect the great plan of life to which we all belong. And uh, the mystics of Europe seem to have understood this. The mystics mystics came to to realize in the end that the whole symbolism, the whole emblemata of things, 
is a single story, the story of the eternal quest of that which alone can bring peace. The, the peace of nations, the peace of families, the peace of individuals, all must come from ennobling of human character. Now, we don't all feel very much like ennobling things out here and there, at least. And uh, the problem of a world dedicated to ennobling character seems a long way away. But uh, after all, the gods move quietly, and like the millstones of the gods, universal nature uh, grinds slowly, but actually very fine in the last analysis. And all this problem that we face is just part of the individual finding the way he has to go. We say these are very bad times, but perhaps they are the best times that we have ever had, because for the first time we are facing problems that must be solved. We can no longer run them under the edge of a rug somewhere. We can no longer migrate to another continent to get away from persecution or the pressures of life. We have to face them now. And with the proper enlightenment, each one will become worthy of knighthood in this story of human progress. We all must now begin to think, as we never have before, of what constitutes integrities. We will have to decide whether we want to go on making mistakes and suffering, or whether it would be more comfortable to change our own ways and let the light of truth lead us in the direction we should go. So stressful times are good times. And in the story of the Grail, the knights were not only uh, sworn to this service, but they had a knight errantry, for they had the sword of quick detachment. They had not only love and wisdom, but the courage to defend the right. And this courage to defend the right, however, is always uh, in need of a definition of what is right. To, find, to defend the right means to always stand for the truth. To defend the right means to come to the aid of truth where it is endangered, if it is in our power to do so. To defend the right does not mean to keep things going the way we want them to in a material sense, but to defend the right is to prove to ourselves and others that eternal principles rule forever, and that those who are the true honored Christian soldiers are the ones who will defend the integrities of life, regardless of the cost to themselves in material concerns. Christ gave one great commandment to his followers, a new commandment, love one another. Now this is a voice of heaven speaking, and there will be no peace on earth until that divine emotion is firmly established in the hearts of human beings. No great miracle is going to bring it. The great miracle will come in each individual life when suddenly comes the realization of the meaning of it all. All study, all matters of a personal improvement, all religious and philosophical research, all these things are to help us to get into a condition of consciousness in which it is possible for this mystery of enlightenment to occur. The mystics with their illuminations were brought into an emotional, spiritual contact with the integrities of life. They suddenly saw the air and the land beneath their feet, the waters, all these things as living testimonies of an eternal reality. They heard the, the cry of the bird. They heard all of the signs and symbols. They watched the mother watch her young. They do, watched all the beauties of life and realize that these are the great symbols of the divine purpose, and that it is up to us to live in the light of truth if we wish this purpose to finally lead the world into peace, security, and honor. The honor must come first in ourselves. And though we may say it is difficult, 
we can say that many can fall upon the right hand and many upon the left. But if we are just, we will stand. We will survive in the great pattern of things because it is so ordained. And those who are faithful unto little things will be made masters over greater things. We must be faithful to the reformation of ourselves. And as this is accomplished, we will be given larger tasks and greater opportunities to be of value to our world and to the powers that created it. So at this Christmas time, the idea that the whole universe is just one church and that the voices of angels can rise only when human beings and universal beings everywhere pay homage to the eternal altar of the human and divine souls. All this was part of something that was taught 2,000 years ago. But uh, people didn't really listen too well then. And they're not listening too well at the moment. But they're going to have to learn to listen for the things we all dream of, the hopes we all have, the future we want for our children, the blessed values to people all over the world who are now suffering tyranny, martyrdom, and destruction. All these conditions can only be cured when the love of God and the love of man are strong in each of us and that we are dedicated to this service of universal cooperation with each other and dedication to the will of heaven. With these commitments, we'll make it. And we're going to make it no matter how long it takes. But if we really try a little harder, it won't take quite so long. And we hope the next year will bring to many people the realization that there is a peace, that things can be solved, but only when the individual stands firm for the principles that he believes and realizes that he is always at mass in the cathedral of the universe. If he gets this idea firmly fixed, things will go much better for him. Well, folks, thank you very much. And I hope you all of you a very, very Merry Christmas, a very Happy New Year, and a very deep study of yourselves. And if all these things are done, things will improve. And there is not one seed that can be planted which will not contribute to the ultimate harvest. We're all working at it. Keep going, folks.